However, America's ties to this city and to this country stretch back further to the earliest days of America's independence. In 1784, our founding father, George Washington, commissioned the Empress of China, a ship that set sail for these shores so that it could pursue trade with the Qing Dynasty. Washington wanted to see the ship carry the flag around the globe and to forge new ties with nations like China. This is a common American impulse, the desire to reach for new horizons and to forge new partnerships that are mutually beneficial. The 1784 trade mission to China was made possible by the Treaty of Paris, which officially ended the war with Great Britain. This treaty, once ratified, would stop the war impressments of U.S. ships and allow the new nation to conduct international trade. Although passed on September 3, 1783, the treaty had to be ratified by the newly elected President Thomas Mifflin and his Confederation government called the United States in Congress Assemble. This fourth United States in Congress Assemble convened in Annapolis and President Mifflin scheduled a ratifying session for the Treaty of Paris on December 15, 1783. The delegates, however, failed to achieve the quorum and the proposed vote on the treaty was then rescheduled to coincide with the last great act of the Revolutionary War, George Washington's resignation as Commander-in-Chief. Congress had arranged for a dinner in Washington's honor on Monday the 22nd of December. The following day, December 23rd, 1783, the United States and Congress assembled gave the Commander-in-Chief a public audience in their legislative chamber. What made this action especially remarkable was the fact that George Washington surrendered his Commander-in-Chief Commission to President Mifflin, who by all accounts conspired in the Conway Cabal to replace him as Commander-in-Chief with Horatio Gates in 1777. Despite the historical magnitude of this event, the Fourth United States and Congress assembled failed again to achieve a quorum, nine states, even for Washington's resignation as Commander-in-Chief. On January 14, 1784, South Carolina Representative Richard Beresford, who was ill, arrived in Maryland, achieving the required nine-state quorum to ratify the treaty. The vote was immediately taken, and a definitive treaty of peace, which began in the name of the Most Holy and Undivided Trinity, was ratified as follows given under the seal of the United States, witness His Excellency Thomas Mifflin, our President. The war was now officially over, and the United States of America would be recognized internationally as a sovereign nation. America trade was now free from British control. Revolutionary War financier, also a signer of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, Robert Morris seized on a new opportunity by hiring a ship with other investors to establish a trade route to China. On January 30th, 1784, through President Mifflin's United States and Congress Assemble, with the political help of Delegate James Monroe, a future President of the United States, Robert Morris secured the official U.S. papers for Captain John Green and his ship, now called the Empress of China. The Empress of China was a three-masted, square-rigged, 1783 privateer ship and left New York Harbor on George Washington's birthday, February 22, 1784, transporting the first official representative of the American government, Council Samuel Shaw, to Canton, China. The ship's cargo was lead, 30 tons of ginseng, cotton, camel cloth, 2,500 animal skins, and several barrels of pepper. The most profitable cargo was the ginseng, which grew wild in the 13 states because it was valued by the Chinese for its healing powers. The emperors of China reached Canton on August 30, 1784, but Samuel Shaw, Captain Green, and the crew were not free to roam the country. Instead, they were limited to compounds called Hongs, where the Chinese merchants called on them to trade. It was successful. The ship returned to New York City in May 1785, 
filled with cargo of tea, tableware, silks, exotic plants, new metal alloys, and Chinese cotton. Net and Robert Morris and his investors over $30,000, inspiring a host of new U.S. merchants to enter into the Far East trade. You cannot imagine my excitement when President Barack Obama agreed to conduct the Chinese town hall meeting on November 15, 2009, the 232nd birthday of the Articles of Confederation, which was the Constitution that formed the United States in Congress assembled and the Confederation government that sent the Empress of China on its 1784 trade mission to Canton. President Obama, to my delight, did address the first international U.S. trade mission, stating, However, America's ties to this city and to this country stretch back further to the earliest days of America's independence. In 1784, our founding father, George Washington, commissioned the Empress of China, a ship that set sail for these shores so that it could pursue trade with the Qing dynasty. Washington wanted to see the ship carry the flag around the globe and to forge new ties with nations like China. This is a common American impulse, the desire to reach for new horizons and to forge new partnerships that are mutually beneficial. Like his predecessor, President George Bush, who mistakenly commissioned the presidential gold dollars beginning with George Washington, President Obama was unaware of the existence of the U.S. presidency under the Articles of Confederation. It was President Thomas Miffin who signed the papers for the Empress of China. Amazingly, George Washington, then a private citizen, would not take the oath of office until April 1789, over five years later. On November 15, 2009, a great opportunity was lost in Shanghai, China, because President Obama's advisors did not prepare this great man properly. Had President Obama known the facts, he could have shed an international spotlight on America's first trade mission, the Confederation government and its leaders that forged the United States of America during its war for independence into a republic that we all benefit from today. Now, this historic opportunity has been relegated to another plain old stand close video on the forgotten presidents of the United States. Thank you for tuning in.